All right, maybe it got 60% that weren't. Uh, my, my wife couldn't be with us because of some mitigating circumstances, but um, we love your pastors. We just thank God for what he's doing in them and through them and through you. But before I even get started, because I've got a couple ways I need to go, and I really don't know which way yet, but I do know i got to do this first. Uh, my wife's got a book back there. It's called Romancing Your Creator, and it talks about what your worship does to God because that's the only thing God can't do for himself is worship himself. And But there's a section in there, and it talks about the love of God. It's found on page 26. And uh, I, I want you to get one of those books. Why don't you, I just want to bless you. It, it'll be good for you. But I want to read this to you. She wrote this. It says, uh, The love God has for you is unconditional. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. There's nothing that you can do to stop it. God, from, Nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. Let me say that again. No matter what you may do, God will not stop loving you. You are of infinite value and worth to him because he loves you. His love for you gives you worth. Think about it. The greatest, most powerful, most important person in the whole universe absolutely adores you. He prizes you as the most valuable treasure in existence. You hold such value in his sight that he bankrupted heaven and sent his son, the most precious, priceless possession, to the earth to die in your place to pay for your sins. All for the purpose, get this now, all for the purpose of bringing you back to him so he could love you. Woo! He has placed you in the very heart of the most enduring and pure love in all existence, the love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There in the center of their love for one another, you became, whew, you became the object of the individual and compounded love of the Godhead. The magnitude of such love is beyond comprehension. God calls you not into an empty, empty, realistic, ritualistic religion, but into a white hot love affair with himself. He, as the greatest lover in the universe, desires for you to be the darling of all his affections and the very apple of his high, of his eye, his chosen, his beloved. Man, I'm telling you, you know, faith is important. But if we'll come to learn how much God loves us, that will cause our faith to exponentially grow. And when we find out this very truth here, and there's more to it, you'll just have to read the book. But when you really find out how much he loves you, then there is nothing you'll have such faith that you'll know that you can receive any and everything that he's already, he's already, I said he's already, I said he's already paid for for you. Yes, yes. Understanding that love gives you the supernatural faith to step in to everything that he has provided for you and gives you the ability to do anything that he says that you can do. Amen? Man, I'm telling you. Lord, just help us, help us, help us. Help us understand that love more. Give us a revelation of that love, Father. You know, Jesus proved his love. How much does Jesus love us? That much. Man. Well, that wasn't my message, but it's good anyway. It was for somebody you needed to hear that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now, where do we go from here?
What's 2020 going to be for you? You know, somebody could get up and prophesy and said, you're the, and I've heard it, and probably you already heard it. 2020 is a year of plenty, but that's not necessarily true for everybody because not everybody's going to take hold of that. I said, you've got to take hold of it. See, the Word of God it will work for anybody, but it won't work for everybody because you have to make it yours. The Word of God is true, and it will always come to pass, but it's not always working for everybody because you've got to work it. You know, these people say God's in control. They just don't know God because God's not in control. Remember, Jesus in his own hometown could not do any mighty works because of their unbelief. In Psalm 78, 41, it says they, 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 they limited him. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Why? Because they murmured and complained. Murmur and complaining is a sign of unbelief. And see, these days, when you believe, you will receive, but when you doubt, you have to do without. Faith is so important, and it's not hard. It's not difficult. So what's 2020 going to be for you? 2020 is going to be our best year. Uh, we're going to see more souls won for the Lord this year. We're going to make a greater impact in the body of Christ this year. We're going to have more finances to do what God has called us to do this year. We're going to see more healings and miracles uh, this year than we've ever seen before. We're going to make more effect over in Europe than we've ever made before. 2020 is going to be my best year. What about you? See, anybody know what this is? It's my favorite fruit. It's a mango. But, you know, this seed will never produce what God meant it to produce because I use it as an object lesson. I'm not ever going to plant it. But, see, your faith that comes from the Word of God has to be planted. And if your mouth is not moving, your faith is not working. You know, and, and those of us that's been around this message for any time, we, we kind of learn what not to say, but what are we saying? You know, it, it's good not to say stupid stuff any, any, anymore, but what are we saying? What is God saying to us? You know, God can tell you all these wonderful things, but you have to energize it with your faith, and you have to say it for it to come to pass. This mango seed will never be planted and it will never produce. You have mountain moving faith residing on the inside of you, but it won't never do nothing till it's coming out of your mouth and you're acting in line with the word of it. In Matthew 11, 22 and 23, I use the New King James and, listen, and if it's something else, I'll tell you. But Jesus, you know, tell you a little background on this. Jesus said he was with the guys, and, and he saw this fig tree, and he wanted some of them. He went over to it, and it didn't have any fruit on it. But it appeared to be that time of year, and Jesus said, no fruit will ever grow of you again. And then he went on. He didn't stand there and examine it and look at it and see if his words would come to pass. And then the next day, Peter saw the thing had risen, withered up, and it withered up by the roots. See, a lot of times you start saying stuff, and you don't see nothing, and you give up on what you're saying. But see, faith will work in the unseen realm before it works in the seen realm. And so Jesus, he spoke, and it obeyed him, and the next day said, Lord, it's withered up by the roots. And then Jesus told them, and in verse 22, he said, have the faith of God. Have the God kind of faith. Have the same kind of faith that I just showed you. And then he began to say in verse 23 how it works. He said, assuredly, in other words, there's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. He said, assuredly, I say to you that whoever, how many whoever's have I got in here tonight? 
whoever. In other words, he said, I'm just kicking the doors wide open. Anybody that wants it can have it. That's the way God is. God's not holding anything back. A lot of times we think, well, I'm just waiting on God. No, God's waiting on us. He's already done everything he's going to do. He's already provided everything we need. We just have to latch hold of it with our faith like a bulldog in a bone and don't turn loose of it. Act like sons and daughters of Almighty God and keep the devil right there where Jesus put him. That's the only place biblically that the devil has a right to be. Under our feet. Not in your head, not in your marriage, not in your pocketbook. Come on now. And it's your faith that will keep him there. He has no right to mess with you. We put up with way too much. Matthew 21, 21, he basically says the same thing. Same scenario. Matthew 21, 21, Jesus answered and told, so, said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that if you have faith, and he knew they had faith. Why did he know they had faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because, see, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and they traveled around with him, and they heard the word, so he knew they had faith. He said, oh, surely I say to you that if you have faith and do not doubt, man, doubt is a killer. I said doubt is a killer. What do we do to doubt? We speak to it. I say we speak to it. What do we say? We say what God said. See, that's what eradicates doubt. Speaking the truth will always cause realities in your life to change. You know, faith is not like an ostrich. When we're sick, we, an ostrich, he, you know, they stick their head in the ground and ignore the situation. But faith is not that way. Faith doesn't say, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. Faith declares what the truth says. By his stripes, I am not going to be. Come on now. He bore my sicknesses and bare my diseases, and by his stripes, I am healed. I am, 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 present tense. I'm healed. I don't care what my body feels like. I don't care what my wife says to me. <laughs> I don't care what any unbelieving believer says to me. Doubt peddler. Well, brother, you ought to not be so radical. Well, you ought to not be so stupid. See, because God likes bold people. I said God likes bold people. That's why you're out on a Saturday night. My God. And I tell you, we're gonna get back to we're gonna get back to more meetings. Longer meetings. Come on, I said this this morning. But, I mean, we go to a football game, and we don't leave at halftime. Come on. Somebody, your, your favorite team, it, it, it's, it, it, the game is tied, and your favorite team is down on the 25-yard line, and, and there's three seconds in the game, and they're about getting ready to kick a field goal. You don't leave, do you? Well, how much more is God to us than a stupid field goal? Amen. I mean, we got to get up. We got to get. We got. We we got to get back to the priorities in the things of God. I mean, there's so much stuff out there that's pulling on you, and and you just have to. You, you have to say, look. I'm, I'm not yielding to that stuff. I, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Yeah. But, 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 you know, I, I, I'm going to be at the right place at the right time doing the right thing with the right people with the right attitude. And I'm always going to have God's best. And God can use me any way he wants to use me. And I'm not backing up, slowing down. 
You know, I don't ever plan to retire. I, I'm just refiring. Bless God. Now that I know a few things and have and been through some stuff, look out, devil, here I come. And that's the way we ought to be thinking. The devil is no match for us when we're believing and speaking the word of God. So he said, surely I say to you, have faith and do not doubt. And you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you'll also say to the mountain, be removed, be cast to the sea, and it will be done. He didn't say, well, maybe it'll happen. It sometimes happens. Let's wait and watch and see what happens. You know, there's three kinds of people. Those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that say, what happened? <laughs> and I believe you're just like me. You're one of those that said, makes things happen. But he said, be removed and cast in the sea. See, a mountain in the sea is unseeable, right? I mean, it gets out of sight, out of mind. How did that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked. You spoke it, and it had to obey you. Man, I'm telling you, oh, we have so much authority in this world, we got to use it. And faith and authority, it works hand in hand. And Jesus said, all authority has been given on to me. And then, I'm in Matthew 28 now, then he said, go. In other words, he said, all that authority that I have, I'm giving it to you. You got the goods, now you do what I did. I want to talk to you about prosperity. Because we have a part to play in our prosperity. Actually, we have a part to play in everything. I mean, just like our salvation. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried and resurrected. And then we had to hear it, believe it, and receive him. But it was provided 2,000 years ago. But when did it take place for you? When you believed it, when you heard it, when you received it. Amen. Amen. The things of God are not automatic, but the things of God will always work if you work them. Now, concerning prosperity, there's two important factors. One I've already been talking about, your words, but also your finances. You've got to sow something and then water it with the word of God. And you know, in concerning finances, there's absolutely no limits to what God wants to do for you. But I want to talk about some important things about it. Uh, I want to show you that, that it is God's will for us to prosper. And I want to show you the purpose of prosperity. And then I want to show you how to activate the prosperity that God has for you. So let's begin on God's will for us because faith begins where the will of God is known. Now, I know you know these things, but I'm like Peter. As long as I'm in this body, I'm going to remind you of these things because he said, I know you know it, but I'm going to remind you. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith doesn't come from having heard, you know, how many of you, when's the last meal you ate? Well, we had a nice Chinese meal at, what, 1 o'clock or so today. But, you know, after the service, I'm probably going to want a little something else to eat. Why? Because after I preach tonight, all that energy I got from the Chinese food at lunch today will be expended because of the way I preach. And, you know, I'm probably going to want to eat something in the morning and something tomorrow afternoon unless I choose to fast. And, you know, fasting is not a curse word. 
Thank you for your enthusiasm. Yeah, it does feel like it. <laughs> Fasting doesn't move God. It just makes you sensitive to hear God. Turn with me to 3 John 2. We're looking at God's will. But this guy that wrote 3 John, the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love, he also wrote 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that I have in him that if I ask anything according to his will, what happens? He hears me. And when I know that he hears me, I know that I have the petitions that I desire of him. So in other words, if we find something in the word, we can have it. Nothing can stop it but us. And so with that in mind, his, that, he was thinking that That's because he knew God through his relationship with Jesus. He said this in John, 3 John 2, Beloved, I pray, so he wouldn't tell you to pray about something that wasn't the will of God. He said, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Amplified says it this way. Beloved, I pray in every way that you may succeed and prosper. See, God wants us to be wealthy, healthy, and wise. But there's a flip side to that. You know, there's this guy called the devil, and he's stupid. He's brain dead like some of the politicians that we have today. <laughs> He wants, us, he wants us to be poor, sick, and stupid. Well, Brother Larry, you're going to call me stupid. Well, God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge or lack of the word of God or being stupid. So there's no reason for any Christian or preacher to be stupid anymore. Because there's so much out there on social media or the internet that you, people, the, the body of Christ doesn't have to be stupid anymore. Thank God for dead Hagen that delivered everybody from stupidity. <laughs> so see, on one hand we see the will of God. On one hand we see the devil. Well, where is that in the Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked. John 10.10. 10. The thief, the devil, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But see, Jesus, he came to eradicate that. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. More than enough. He is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. In this context, he's talking about giving. Now, we're still talking about the will of God concerning prosperity for me and you. He says, 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, I wish I had time to prove that to you, but this is one of my subjects I taught in Bible school. You know the house where Jesus was at preaching and they tore the roof off and let the man at Jesus' feet that was Jesus' house. It wasn't Peter's like some theologians say it was. I wish I had time to show you in the scripture, but you'll just have to trust me. Or the pastor will show it to you later. <laughs> anyway, and think about this. You know, he had all these people that got healed and delivered and set free people that had money, and he had a, he, uh, his treasurer was a thief, and he knew it. And what about the clothes that he had on? I mean, why would a rich Roman soldier want to gamble for rags? He had what we would call today an armadi. You know, that's about a three or $4,000 suit in that day and that time. He was rich. 
and he became poor. When did he become poor? The same time he became sin, the same time that he bore stripes on your back. So, see, it all happened at the same time. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Full supply. Abundance. See, prosperity belongs to us because of what, what Jesus did. But it works for us because of what we do. I didn't even get an amen out of that. I'm going to say that again. Prosperity and anything else belongs to us because of what Jesus did, but it works for us because of what we did. Like the new birth, I've already mentioned it. I mean, it was provided, but it only became a reality when we accepted it. I mean, then that is God's ultimate will, that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, but not all men get saved. And it may have taken some of us longer to get saved than others. So some, some of us were more hard-headed. But thank God we are where we are today, and we're enjoying the, what God has provided for us. Amen? So it's God's will for us to prosper. And you know, I, if, if we were doing a seminar, I'd probably spend another hour or so on this one part of it. But, uh, you know, I got one shot at you tonight, and I'm going to have to preach a little short. I said a little short. So ushers, just lock the doors back there. So what's the purpose of prosperity? Uh, money is a tool and not a goal. See, because if money is your goal, then you're missing it. I said if money is your goal, you're missing it. See, because there's so much. You know, when I contacted the airlines and told them I'm, I'm coming here or when I'm going to Europe this, this summer, I mean in April and May, they don't say, well, what are you buying a ticket for? Well, I'm going to go preach the gospel. Well, here, we want to give you a business class ticket, and it's on us. No, they tell me it's going to be so much, right? The gospel in and of itself is free. But it costs money. Come on now. I said it costs money. You know, they, the electric company don't just give you the power to run these lights. and Nobody just, well, maybe somebody did give all the equipment and stuff. But it costs somebody something. Amen? It's not just free, or at least not yet. I said at least not yet. So, let me give you one of my basic scriptures for the purpose of prosperity. Let's go back to the Old Covenant. And let's, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now he starts off talking about don't forget God. Remember God. Remember what all God did for you. Deuteronomy 8, 18. And he said, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get well. Say, God gives me the power to get well. That word power in Hebrew means ability or strength to get wealth. Why? That he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So it, we can bring that over into the New Testament, and he says he gives us the power to get wealth so we can go preach the gospel with him. Because gasoline, it costs. Well, somebody had to pay for the gasoline for you to get here tonight. And for anything you do, it costs money. And especially if you're doing the things of God, you, you know, uh, <clears throat> it costs you. But thank God it's already been provided. Now, he didn't give us just wealth. You know, I could give any one of you. I don't have the means to do it yet, 
but I could give any one of you $100,000 and you could get stupid and lose it all. You could be like some of those folks where I'm staying and bring, spend it all on that one arm bandit. You had the wealth, but you misused it. God just didn't give us wealth. He gave us the ability to get wealth. Heard somebody say one time, see, you can feed a man for a day or you can, or you can give a man a fish and feed a man for a day or you can teach him to fish, like ability to get wealth, and you'll feed him for a lifetime. See, that's what God gave us, the ability to get wealth. And if we get temporarily, we have a temporary period of stupidity and lose it or misuse it, we still got the ability to get more. Amen? God wants you to have all the stuff you want. Riches, things, jewelry. You know, some people get mad at preachers that wear gold or preachers that have nice cars. God, God loves you to have all this stuff. He just doesn't want the stuff to have you. See, so you you, keep your focus right, and there's nothing God can't bless you with. But if the, if, if the stuff is the blessing, then, you know, we focus on God. Like Pastor was talking about, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your understanding. Don't lean to your noodle noggin. Well, I can't say that about you, but, you know, I used, I used to have a noodle noggin, but I don't anymore. I got the mind of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. We're still talking about the purpose of prosperity. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, always, that you always, I said that you always, come on, somebody out will shout, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have abundance for every good work. Or I like to say it like this, every gospel work. See, if that's your goal, God, I just want to be involved in your kingdom. And I'm not called to preach behind a pulpit, but I can send those that do. I can help support the church. I can see that the gospel, your money can go around the world and you'll get to heaven, like I said this morning, and be able to look over your shoulder and see all the people that came to Jesus because you believed God for the finances to help somebody that was called to go. Now, my wife and I, we were goers and we're senders. So I wasn't just satisfied with going myself. And we still support folks now, folks that are preaching to the Muslim nations mostly. Why? Because I want to continually have a full supply. Now, you may have heard Pastor Scott say this, but I want to be like a water hose. Well, what do you mean, Brother Larry? Well, see, a water hose, you connect it to the spout where the glory comes out, where God is, and then God turns that faucet on and there's a, con there's a flow of water coming out of you because you, you begin to be a conduit. And you might say, well, you know, the water hose doesn't get to keep any of the water. No, it doesn't get to keep any water, but it's always wet on the inside. Glory. <laughs> See, I don't want to hold on to anything because I know God, if I, if I take care of God's business, uh, God is always going to take care of my business. Yeah. He's always going to give me all, all my needs, wants, and desires as long as it's for him. And I'll always have more than enough. Yeah. Yeah. Abundant supply. 
to fund the gospel, to preach the gospel. Because prosperity without purpose is poverty. Money is not a tool, it's a goal. I'm going to say this again, but I want you to get it. G prosperity belongs to us because of what Jesus did, and it works for us because of what we do. Somebody turn the heat up. So how do we become prosperous? Isaiah chapter 48, 17. Isaiah 48, 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God. He's our God who teaches you to profit and leads you by the way that you should go. The message, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. It says, as long, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest. See, there has to be a seed before there's a harvest. Like I said, this, this mango seed will never produce a tree that will never produce other mangoes that will, will out of every mango, there'll be another seed that will produce another tree and other mangoes. But I won't let that happen because I like to use this as a teaching example. But if I had some good ground and I planted it and watered it, see, because you got to have a seed, but you got to water it. What's water? I'm glad you asked. The words of your mouth. What are you saying about the seed that you planted? What are you saying about the tithes that you've been paying? It's awful quiet in this Presbyterian church. I said, what are you saying about, well, you know, I've been tithing all my life. Somebody I love dearly used to say that because she didn't know. I, me and Daddy have tithed all our life, and, but if ever did anything for us, we don't know it. Duh! We'll talk about that. I got ahead of myself, but that's all right. So let me expose a lie that some Christians use so that they get off the hook of paying tithes. Tithing is under the law. Well, is that true? Well, let me show you from the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20, Now, he's talking about Abram, but we know that Abram became Abraham, the father of faith. And in Genesis 14, 18, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, talking about Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram, the God of the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand and he talking about Abraham he gave a tithe to Abraham Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek you know what a tithe is I got a pastor friend that kind of went a little bit different direction and he's talking about tithes all the time and one of his parishioners came up to him and said pastor you keep talking about this ties thing, but I don't ever see you wearing one. <laughs> no, a tithe is 10%. You, and some people might say, well, I tithe 15%. No, you don't. You tithe 10% and you give 5% over. And, you know, my wife and I, we just determined we want to increase the amount that we give every year. Why? Because I want more every year. And if I want more every year, I learn that I have to give more every year. Amen. Amen. And I have to keep my words right, too. Amen. See, because there's absolutely, listen to me, there's absolutely no limits to what God can do for you financially or any other area. We're 
the only ones that put the limits on it. Now, let's go back into the New Testament. We'll see the same thing in Hebrews chapter 7. See, because I don't understand how anybody can he read Hebrews 7 and say tithing is not for today. <laughs> or it's under the law. Uh, Hebrews 7 verse 1, and we'll read through 3. And it's talking about what we just saw in Genesis. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who meant Abraham, so he calls him Abraham now instead of Abram, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Some people say, well, do I pay tithes on everything or do I pay tithes on what I get after the government gets their part? Well, and I just tell people, well, do you want God to help you pay your taxes? I should have got at least one amen out of that one, but that's all right. I'll keep going. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remain a, a priest continually. Who is he talking about? Jesus, of course. And that was really Melchizedek. Jesus is a type of Melchizedek. But Brother Larry still tithing is under the law because that was Old Testament. Well, I got a question to ask you. Who brought the law? The tablets. Moses, right? So when did Moses come along? in this thing in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the history of God. 400 years after Abraham paid a tithe. So it couldn't be under the law. I said it couldn't be under the law. That's just an excuse that stingy Christians use. Like I said this morning, I used to tell my people at church when I pastored in Poland, I said, you know, if you have problems paying your tithes, come up here and get saved, and that will stop that problem. Because when you get saved, Romans 5, say, 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And if you really love God, you'll give God what he said that he'd like to have. Amen? See, because where your money is, I could look at your checkbooks or ever how you give to, into the gospel and tell where your heart is. Well, I don't give nothing, Brother Larry. Well, where your heart, where your treasure is, where your money is, that's where your heart is. See, God's wanting to break you loose. I said God's wanting to break you loose concerning your thinking about giving. He wants you free so he can get stuff to you. Because he can't get it to you if he can't get it through you. I'm going to say that again. He can't get it to you if he can't get it through you. If he can't trust you enough to do what he's asked you to do, it's difficult for him to get it to you. And we're talking about prosperity, money, things. So, with all of that in mind, let's go to the major scripture that we look at concerning tithing in Malachi. And that scripture Pastor used is really good too. Because that's talking about tithing. Malachi 3. And we're going to read 6 through 14. He said, I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are consumed, O sons of Jacob. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. He said it back then. It still is good for us today. Regardless of what some 
uninformed preachers tell you. And, you know, we don't have to tithe. We have the privilege of tithing. So God's not trying to get something from you. He's trying to get something to you. But see, I found out a long time ago that I had to learn how to do things God's way in order to get God's best. So, in verse 7, Malachi 3, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from me and from my ordinances, and you've not kept them. In other words, God said, You haven't been doing what I told you you need to do. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? And then he tells us, Will a man rob God? Well, how can I rob God? Okay, let me give you a natural example. Have you ever been out with somebody and you just feel impressed that you want to bless them? You want to buy something for them. You want to feed them a meal. And they say, oh, no, 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 I can't receive that. And you say, well, you're going to rob me of a blessing? Have you ever heard that? Does that ever happen to you? Well, see, because if, if, if we don't respond to what God says is right, we rob him of a blessing. We rob him of the opportunity to do what his word says he's do because we won't cooperate with him. That's how we rob him. Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. Not just tithes. See, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, mm. I'm not satisfied with just giving God 10%. Because I want more and I understand the principle of seed, time, and harvest. The more I give, the more I can get, and the more I get, the more I can give, and the more I give, the more I can get, and so on. It's like a snowball in a hill. When you put that snowball, now I know you guys don't know about that unless you go somewhere where it snows. But you get up on, you take a snowball about like this, and you start rolling down the mountain, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? What happens? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. See, God wants the ball, the snowball, to get started in your life, and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger as long as you continue to cooperate with him and keep your words right. And we'll talk more about that later. Verse 7, he said, You have gone away from my ordinances, and you've not kept them. But you said, In what way shall we return? Two ways. Your money and your words. And we'll see this later in verse 13. See, we return to God with our money and with our words. Tithes and offerings. Verse 8 and 10, it talks about tithes and offerings. 10%. Give God 10% of everything. Give God, well, after all, he's the one that gave you the brains to be able to do the natural stuff that you do. I mean, it wasn't the devil. The devil would try to talk you out of it because he knows the blessings that's coming your way if you'll obey God. And then two, your words. You find that in verse 13 and 14, but we'll go back to it. He said in verse 10, just bring whatever your heart leads you to bring. Well, brother, I'm not led to tithe. And then I had this little piece of lead, and I'd, I'd give it to him. I'd say, now you're lead. <laughs> that cured that problem. You know, us preachers got to figure out some way to get people to obey God. But anyway, bring all, 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 all of the 10%. Not 9%, not 11%, 10%. Not 
Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Now, I wish I had time to tell you what the storehouse is and show you the scriptures, but I don't, but he's talking about the local church. Don't send it to some TV evangelist or some traveling ministry. Your tithes don't belong there. They, tie, they belong to where you get fed, to where God has told you he wants you to be a part of. And, and, and here, let me just go a little side journey here. Don't ever let your stupid thinking or unbelieving believers or the dumb thoughts of the devil take you out of the place that God puts you. Because God knows exactly what you need to have and he knows exactly where to put you. And for this case, it's here. I've seen people get out of the will of God and get out of the association of the group of people and it's just like they take and put a stob in their foot and the rest of their life is just like this. They never, now I'm not saying they die and go to hell. I'm not saying that, that God brings bad things to them. I'm just saying they don't ever receive God's bless, God's blessing. See, it always pays to obey God and not man unless the man is telling you what God says. I'm so adamant about the word of God, I, like I said this morning. I'm so confident that if I, I know, I, I love people enough to tell them the truth and if they'll obey the truth and act on it, they'll get the blessings that God said they can have and learn more and then not just get it for themselves, help others. See, that's what this thing's all about. It's not just me, my wife, my son, and, and, my, and his wife, us four, no more. It's about expanding and being a blessing to wherever God tells you to be a blessing. Bring all the tithes in the storehouse and there will be food in my house. See, you, you tithe here. And that enables them to do what God has called them to do here. You'll get good food. And I know you get good food from them. Boy, Pastor, we need to teach these people how to say amen. <laughs> amen just means I agree, so be it. That's all it means. But these are good pastors. They love you. I meant to say this mor this, this morning. But we had supper last night, and they had such good things to say about you guys and the guys at the first church this morning. They're not down bad-mouthing you or talking about you or telling me about all the stuff that's not going right. They love you, and they want God's best for you. And I love you, and I want God's best for you, and that's why I'm adamant about preaching the Word. Because I know that's the only thing that's going to cause change in your life. If I read out of Reader's Digest, it's not going to help you. Bring all the tithes in the storehouse and me food in my house and try me. One translation says prove me. One translation says put me to the test. That's the only place that I've been able to find. Now, there may be, but I haven't found it. That's the only place that God said, try me, put me to the test concerning paying your tithes. You pay your electric bill, don't you? Because if you don't, they'll come cut your power off unless you get uh, some assistance from the government and we go into uh, uh, socialism. Well, I'm not going to go there. I did this morning, but it, you don't want it. I lived under it for 18 years, and you don't want it. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> and he said, if I will not open the windows of heaven, get this now, and pour out to you such blessing. He didn't say he'd rain money down on you. See, because there's, there's lots of blessings that we receive from tithing that's not just monetarily things. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't give enough money to have your children grow up in the things of God and become godly.
godly men and women. There's no price that you can pay for that. And I could go on and on and on about many different blessings. He said, I will, I will pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, I'm not there yet, but that's my goal. See, because I know when I get to the point that I have to pray and ask God what to do with all the stuff I got. Come on now. Verse 11. And he said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. That Hebrew word means seed eater. You know, the devil would like to eat your seed. And he can if you'll say what he said or if you'll do what he tells you to do. Well, that preacher's just after my money. Yeah, I'm after your money because if I got your money, I got your heart. See? It's not money. It's not the issue. It's, it's obedience to the word of God. He said, I'll rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Now, see, under the new covenant, we have authority over the and we can speak to him and tell him where to stay. <laughs> Amen? He said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that you will not destroy the fruit of your ground nor shall the vine bear its fruit in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And I like what the old King James says in this. He said, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. What is that? Supernatural longevity for everything you own. Now, you ladies may not want to be like the Israelites and have shoes that last 40 years, but your cars won't wear out. Your garage door won't wear out. Anything that you possess won't wear out if you're a tither and you declare it. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now let's look at verse 13, because now he begins to talk about his words. See, we've been talking about the seed, the tithe, and offerings. I said and offerings. I hadn't said a whole lot about it, but tithing and then offerings, see? But you got to start with the tithe first, and then the offerings begin to come. And then as you begin to increase your offerings, things increase. But it starts with the tithe. Say, it starts with the tithe. My prosperity starts with the tithe. And see, if you're not tithing, then shame on you. Come up here, we're going to have a... We're, we're going to give you an opportunity to get saved tonight and you won't have a problem tithing anymore. I feel like a lady with long hair. <laughs> Verse 13. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? He said, you have said it is useless to serve God. You know, it don't, it don't make any difference if I tithe or not. God's still going to love you, love me. Yeah, he will. But he can't bless you. I said he can't bless you. He can't get to you what he wants to get to you because you'll be, you're stubborn and you won't do what he's told you to do. You know, as a little boy, I used to get whippings. Now, I know, I know the... You know, people don't believe in much of that anymore. But I used to get a whipping when I disobeyed, when I would not obey my mom and daddy. And I should have got more of them. And maybe I wouldn't have been in the mess I was in. But anyway, that's another story. He said, you have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? In other words, that we've done what he said to do concerning the tithe, that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts. See, because if you're not planting the seed, 
and you're not paying the tithe and you're not giving offerings and you're not talking about what you're doing concerning the word of God because if your mouth is not moving, your faith is not working. Come on now. If your mouth is not moving, your faith is not working. Okay, let's think about the tithe and the offering. It's like a seed, right? Now, I can take this. I have some of the best ground that California has to offer, and I can put it in the ground. But I don't water my seed. What happens? Nothing. Because this seed has to have good ground, but it also has to have water. And it has to have sunlight, of course. But if it never gets any water, it will never grow, right? Or, uh, we can look at the other side of this. I can get over here, and I can water. What? I can water the ground, water the ground, water the ground, water the ground, but I don't have any seed in the ground. What do you get when you water the ground, even if it's good ground? I'm watering this ground. I just don't understand what's happening. You're making a lot of mud, but that's all. See, you've got to water your seed. Your tithe and offering has to work with your words. This is what I do with this passage of Scripture, and I almost do it every day because I shower almost every day, and I do most of my confessions in the shower or in the morning when I read my Bible. You know, it's good practice to read your Bible every, 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 every day. Just like I said, we eat every day. Why not feed our spirit every day? Father, I thank you that you've given me the opportunity and the privilege of loving you and obeying you. And I bring my tithe into the storehouse so that there'll be meat in the house of God. And you said, Father, you said it, Father. You said if I would give my tithe, you would open the windows of heaven to me and you would pour out to me such blessings that I would not have room enough to receive it. Because you are the God that's more than enough. You're El Shaddai. And I thank you because I'm obedient. That opens the windows of heaven and you pour out blessings. You made all grace abound toward me, Father, that I have always have all sufficiency in all things and I have the supernatural ability to every good work. And the devourer is rebuked on my behalf. Satan, you take your hands off my finances. And then I tell God, what I, I call in what I believe for yep. every month. I don't depend on the churches or partners. I decide what I want, what I need on a monthly basis, and I call it in. I tell it to come. And I tell Satan to take his hands off of it. I call in so much money a month. I call in partners a month. We're calling so many faithful substantial monthly partners to do what God's called us to do because I don't work a job. This is my job. But I know if I do my job, God's going to do his part, especially when I'm tithing and giving. And then I say, Father, I thank you that now the devourer is rebuked on my behalf. Satan, take your hands off my finances. And I thank you, Father, that my vine doesn't cast its fruit before its time. Everything I own lasts supernaturally long in Jesus' name. And I start naming stuff. I speak to my garage door. I speak to my two cars. I speak to my appliances. I speak to my electronics. And I say they will last supernaturally long. They'll last as long as I need them to last and they'll work for me as long as, as I want them to work for me. Yes. 
See, your tithe and your words, your offering and your words have to work together. Because if you're saying, yeah, I mean, you could be stickler for tithing and offering and, and not say the right thing. Well, I just don't understand. This stuff's just not working for me. The pastor said it works for him. I don't understand. It won't work for me. You know, we've been tithing and tithing and tithing, and we just go more in debt and debt and debt. This is just not working for me. Well, guess why? Keep your big blab, blab, blab mouth shut and say what God said. Take these scriptures and, and say what God said about your tithe. You know, because Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. But in the context of that, he's talking about giving. So, how can I get started in this? Maybe you're in a situation where you just can't see how to do this because you've got more bills than, than you have money coming in on a monthly basis. For two years I went to Rhema. God told me he wanted me to work part-time for the ministry. Now, I, the man that led me back to the Lord he, I went in business with him, and I was a painting contractor, and my intention was to go out to Rama. I took some paint equipment, and I was going to make some cards up, and I was going to put them in paint stores, and I was going to get me some Saturday jobs. Well, God told me, he told me, and God's got to tell you, he said, I don't want you to work there. There's so much going on out here, I want you in every meeting that you can be in. See, because I only worked at 4.30, and there was a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm living in Tussle, Jerusalem, and there's meetings all over the place, and Dead Hagen was alive. And so, but I made a mistake when I first got there. I made a budget, and I had more than $200 going out than I had coming in. So I just wadded that paper up and I said, God, you said if I'd obey you, you'd take care of me. And I figure somewhere, now we're talking 1986 to 88, and this don't sound like a lot of money, but back then it was. I figure there was probably about ten or $15,000 came in supernaturally because I did what God told me to do and go into school and making myself available to get fed and be in the meetings he wanted me to be in. But I had started tithing before I ever went. I mean, I just said, and please, I'm not bragging on me. When I got saved, I was so excited about the things of God. I just wanted, God showed me supernaturally. He healed me, delivered me, and gave me a brand new life. And I just loved God and wanted to do what I saw in his word. But maybe you're in a situation you need a jump start. Well, here's your scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 9, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 9, 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower. Get that. So you got to be a sower before he will supply the seed for you to sow. You've got to qualify in order to get the blessing. He said he will supply seed to the sower and bread for food and supply and multiply the seed you have sown and in increase of the fruits of your righteousness. The Amplified says it like this. Now he who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed. But see, you've got to sow it before he can multiply it. Amen? But you've got to, you've got to believe that you will be a sower and then when you're a sower, you can say, okay, Lord, I qualify. 
now I'm expecting you to give me seed to sow, and then you get the snowball rolling down the hill. And then you can start tithing. All your bills are paid. And you know, it's not a bad idea to get out of debt. I don't have time for that. But anyway, Pastor Jeremy will tell you how to get out of it. So, ha, 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 ha. God will give you seed to sow, provision for others in the world. God will give you food to eat, provision for you and, your, you and yours. When you sow what God gives you, God will multiply what you sow and give you more to sow. So just become a sower. Believe God to be a sower. It would be like you've got this awesome friend and you've known him, you've trusted him. He's a financial advisor. And he comes to you and he says, hey man, or hey sis, I got this deal. I've got this investment. And it's the best thing. Now I've been I've been in this business for twenty something years, and it's the best thing that I've ever seen. And he said, I, I want you to invest in it. He says, as a matter of fact, it's so good, I'm gonna give you the money to invest. <laughs> and then I'm gonna be watchful and watch over it and cause your investment to multiply. Man, that's what that scripture will do for you. If you become a sower, God said he would give seed to the sower and then multiply the seed that you sow. Man, what a deal. I mean, there, there, there's nothing better. Now think about this in the natural. You go down to the bank, say, say, uh, in, <clears throat> in Tulsa, I got my money in the Arvis Bank, which is part of Walmart. But I can't go to a security bank and tell them, say, hey, now here's my ID. I want to make a withdrawal. And they look up your ID, they look you up and they say, well, Mr. Keith, you don't have an account with us. I said, oh, I don't know. I know I don't have an account with you. But I want some money. Give me some money. Well, they they think you're crazy, right? You got to have seed in the ground. You got to talk about it. Water it. I said water it. Let me give you one more example, and I'll close with this. Concerning the tithes and offerings. In the words of your mouth, let's think about it as you're in a wagon. You're on your life's journey in, in adventures with God, and you got these two horses that are pulling you. You got your tithe and offering horse, and, and you've got your word horse. And these guys are working great together, but all of a sudden something happens. And, and a, a financial crunch comes, and you start you stop tithing or giving, and so that horse sits down. Where are you going to go? You can't go because you got to have both horses pulling in the same direction. If one horse sits down on you, you're not going nowhere. Or you're tithing and you're giving. And, but you're saying the wrong things. Well, that makes your word horse sit down. You're not going anywhere. See, these things have to work together. And it's not just about having your needs, your wants, and your desires. It's about what you can do for the kingdom of God. The investments you can make in eternity. And I just believe that we all want to get to heaven and look over our shoulder and see the multitude that came to Jesus because we did what I've been talking about. Because prosperity without a purpose is poverty. Money 
is not a goal, it's a tool. And there's no limit to what God wants to do for you financially. No limits. No limits. The only limits is the limits that we put on them. And I don't care if you're in a, a government-supplied program, you still don't have to put limits on God. I don't care if you, you're, you're a, 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 a stay-at-home mom with the children and your husband is the only financial source coming into the family, you don't have to put limits on God. I don't care if you work at McDonald's and make minimum wages that is not your source. Or if you're a CEO of a company, that is not your source. Now that is a means in which God can bless you, but if that's your source, you're looking at the wrong thing. I'm, I'm just kind of circling the airport now. I just want to see what else God wants to do because I know there were some other things. But some time I get to preaching, I get into the flesh and I, I miss some things. So, if there's anybody that wants to qualify and be a sower, Maybe for some reason or another, we're not going to ask you. Maybe, maybe these ha things haven't been working for you. Maybe you haven't been tithing or giving. But you want to get the snowball rolling down the hill, and you want to get God's financial plan of prosperity working in your life. And you're saying by standing to your feet that I want, I'm determining tonight that I'm going to be a sower. Just stand to your feet. anyone else you're ter determining tonight because that scripture God said he would give seed to the sower and then he would multiply the seed that you sow so I want to pray for my brother father I thank you by him standing up he's He's telling you and everybody in here that he qualifies right now. He's made a hard decision to be a sower. Now we expect you, Father, to do exactly what you said you'd do. You said you would give him seed to sow. So now we thank you that that seed is on its way right now. Now, angels, you go and cause that money to come. Yes, sir. In the name of Jesus, you cause that seed to come in the name of Jesus because he's a sower now. And God, you said you'd give seed to a sower. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now say that. Remind God. You know, <clears throat> how many of you got children? If you tell your child you're going to do something, couple of, and you know when we're, like one time I remember my daddy told me it's going to take us to the circle and it was about three weeks away and I just Lord God and I'd get to thinking about that and I'd get excited and a couple of days would go by and I said now daddy you said we're going to go to the circus and we're going to get to see the clowns and the elephants and to eat popcorn and hot dogs and all that stuff when are we going to get to go daddy and he'd tell me and, and that calmed me down. And then a couple of days later, I'd get to thinking about it again. I said, now, Daddy, 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 when, when are we going to get to go? You said you was going to take me. You know, my daddy never got mad at me because I would remind him of what he said. Do you ever get mad at your children when they remind you of what you told them you was going to do? Well, how much more does God get excited when we remind him of his word? Amen? If you have uh, any kind of stomach problems, digestive problems, uh, if 
anointing is here to heal you right now. So just come on up, we'll lay hands on you, and that'll be the end of that. This shoulder. Who is that? It's that arm. freedom, freedom, in Jesus' name, no more, no more, no more restrictions, and I command this, this shoulder to be strengthened now, right now, supernaturally, supernaturally, pain, you have no place in my sister, now you have to pack your bags and go, in Jesus' name, thank you, thank you, thank you, now is there anything that you could not do because of that? but I'm just going to remind you, you you work on it with your faith and speak it to them because you've seen an improvement but you keep your faith hooked up thank you Father the anointing's working in me and I'm healed, my shoulder's healed pain can't stay or live in my shoulder in Jesus name something you couldn't do. You couldn't do that. How is it? Awesome. No pain? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now see, this is a little different. I'm not praying for you in faith. The Spirit of God reveals this, and I know that when God reveals things, that we need to check it out because that helps you understand God moving. I don't take any credit for it, it's him. But also it's a teaching tool so that you can see me. That's how I learned how to minister. 
watching other men and women of God hear from heaven. And, and I figure, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Kind of like in the Old Testament. You know, if God can use a donkey, I know he can use me. Amen. I mean, that, that, that delivers you from anything. So, uh, I'm not going to ask you to come forward because this would kind of be embarrassing, but I'm going to deal with it. So, hemorrhoids, you got to go. I command you to dissolve in the name of Jesus. You can't stay in the bodies of God's children, so just dissolve. I speak to those hemorrhoids and I command them to dissolve dry up. You'll have no more problem with that in the name of Jesus. Now, if you want to write us and tell us about it, that'll be okay. We won't tell them who it is. <laughs> you know, because I like to know. I don't want to get up here and perform. You know, and if I miss it, I'd like to know it so I can correct it. Amen. and be glad that which you have in your heart that which you've talked about that which you've seen shall surely come to pass because you, you don't have to be concerned with what you see all you have to be concerned with is what you know Amen So thank you Lord Thank you for this my brother and sister Thank you, thank you, thank you The right place at the right time The right place at the right time I've been married 31 years, you have an opportunity to walk in love. But there's power in the energy. There's power in the energy. And if there is, I'm not saying there is, but if there is, and not just for these two, for anybody else that's a couple, if there is anything that comes up, get together and speak to it instead of blaming one another. Speak to it because the devil is the one that tries to break division because a house divided can't stand. But see, you don't get mad, you don't blame the other, but, but you, you, you sit down, you talk about it, and you, 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 you focalize, you, you, you see what it is, you know what it is, and you start speaking to it. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything there, but there will be an opportunity. Things do come of our flesh, you know. That, and this goes for any other couple. You know, it, it's not good to fuss and fight about things. It's good to, 
know where the attack is coming from, but joining together in love and speaking to that thing, it'll have to stop. Because the devil brings division, God brings unity. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's up, man? Awesome. How about you? May I have your hand? Sometimes I just have a leading to go to somebody, and I don't know what in the world I'm doing, but sometimes when I, when I join hands with them, the Lord will show me something. how to get it to come, don't you, don't you, yeah, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, now, now you're using some of the stuff that's already been given to you, aren't you, you see, the thing about God, the more you use, the more you do what he's told you to do, and the more those impartations and the endowments that he's given you, the more you use it, the more it increases. It's kind of like pumping iron. You know, you won't get stronger unless you put an extra five or an extra ten, do an extra rep, or stay an extra 30 minutes. Spiritual things. Sorry, sorry about that. That's anointed That's spirit. Anointed. <laughs> Spiritual things are, are like that. You look like you, you know, you know what I'm talking about when it comes to pumping iron. I used to do that. Man, you ought to seen me when I was at Rhema. I wasn't quite that big, but I, I got the chest of drawers disease. My chest dropped to my drawers. I got, I got to start working out again. did all right, brother. I said, you did all right. I mean, if you didn't do any any other thing right, you got a prime example right there. You really ought to be proud of him. And I know you are. But you did good. Now, I know there's other areas, but thank you for the help that he's been Hallelujah. in this ministry. Now sometimes it's difficult to receive from your son, but you recognize the gift and you overlook the, 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 the natural connection here. So thank you, Father, for the help, for the help he's been and the help that he will continue. my better half had been here, but maybe next time. No, not maybe next time, but real brief. She will next time. Father, I thank you. Now, I trust you, Holy Spirit. I, I'm going to I'm going to put you, I remind you, Lord, of what you said. You said that 
the Holy Spirit would remind us of the things that we've heard. So now the seed has been sown. The Word of God, now I know they get it on a regular basis, but Lord, you remind them of the things that were said so they can, they can act on it and be productive in it. In Jesus' name. Because there's so much more in the area of finances that needs to take place here, but we've got a good foundation. We've got a good core of people that know what to do with what you've told them to do. We thank you, Lord. We, we just give you all the praise and honor and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ain't God good? Amen. We want to receive a, an offering tonight for their ministry. Ushers are in the aisle. What a wonderful day. Amen. Just in the presence of God. There's just a richness. Amen. Just being in these anointed services where the Spirit of God is moving and flowing. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Where are you headed off to next? Santa Barbara, where are you going to Wednesday night? Bakersfield. All right. It's going to be good. Praise God. You're going to have good services there. Amen. Good move of God there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we can receive that offering. We'll pray. Father, we thank you tonight for... All that we've received all throughout the day, the Holy Ghost has just filled our cup to overflowing. Thank you, Father, for your word that's been given to us. Thank you for the, the spirit of faith that's been imparted into our hearts this morning and tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the moving of your spirit. We're so thankful to you. You've been so good to us. We honor you tonight as we give, as we communicate back. We want to sow seed into what you're doing in the earth today. The word and the spirit is moving all over. Hallelujah. Through ministries just like theirs. Tonight we want to send them. Send them on to the next place where people can receive and be blessed. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Ushers, y'all can receive that. Hallelujah. Can you believe it's the last Sunday in February? Oh Hallelujah. Where is this year going? We're so thankful, so thankful to be in Marietta. Amen. So next Sunday, don't miss it. We'll be here again at 6 p.m. Invite somebody. Invite four people. Why don't we multiply our, our, our campus four times ourselves? Amen. And just watch what God will do. Because I tell you what God's doing today is he's ministering to people. It's the heart of God to reach people. Amen. So let's get them in the house. Amen. And let God do something in their life. Amen. Go by their book table on your way out the door. There's CDs. There's books. There's things that will bless you and feed your faith. Amen. We love you. Why don't you stand to your feet. Shake hands with 5,000 people. Testify to them. The Lord is good to me. We'll see y'all next Sunday.